Recruiting insider on WHNO TV 20. He's a tri host of both Ken Trahan's original prep football report and the Three Tailgaters show on WGSO 990 AM. He's a columnist for SportsNOAA.com. He served as the head coach at St. James High School for 19 years, guided them to the Dome on more than one occasion in state championship games, and served as an assistant coach at Tulane, at Chalmette, at Rommel, and at Bottle during his time. And of course, the New Orleans Saints host the Atlanta Falcons on Monday Night Football at 7 30. Please give a warm, great New Orleans Sports Foundation quarterback club welcome to Rick Gailey. Rick. Thank you very much, Ken. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, and I want to thank Ken for getting me, uh, after 34 years of coaching, into media. Came into this avenue by a little bit different angle, but Ken got me into it. And I've been so appreciative to work with such great people like Ken. Uh, Ed Daniels, Roe Brown, Renee Nato, Lenny Van Gilder, Jude Young, Daryl Ashley, to be able, uh, for the last six years, to be able to work for a website, to be able to work for a radio station, and to host a television show. If that doesn't tell you about American opportunity, I don't know what does. Uh, a couple of NFL notes. Doug Peterson is off to a 2-0 start with the Philadelphia Eagles. Just a, just a great start there. Well, Doug was the head coach at Calvary Baptist when I was at St. James. We played them in 2007 in the semifinals, and we won. So while I am 1-4 against J.T. Curtis, I am 1-0 against NFL head coaches. <laughs> <laughs> and the Los Angeles Rams are now 1-1 one one after beating the Seattle Seahawks 9-3, not scoring a touchdown, so that continues the streak of the Rams not scoring a touchdown in Los Angeles that extends all the way back to 1994. The Saints are 0-2, and one of the big plays in this last game was the what I call the big fail. A big miss is when a player makes an error that's consequential. A big fail is when a team makes a big error. And I'm going to try something different. We have Jude Young that's convinced me that this will work. As we do in the coaching profession, we're going to go to the video and find out what happened. That's not good. <laughs> we don't use microphones in the coach's office. I was trying to, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll talk loud. All right, here's the formation that led to the block field goal. We're going to see it both from the sideline. And we're also going to see it from the end zone. Now we're, we're where we belong, right, JT? Uh, now, one thing you'll notice is that the right side of the line is normally the left side. So now, Andrews, Pete, there at uh, T Armstead, Streif is over here. He's in his, in his usual spot, but at tight end. And they take the center and put him in a wing, Max Unger. Trying to get bigger people in there. The reason you put these guys on that side is that they use left-handed stances. The left side uses a left-handed stance in an offensive play. The right side uses a right-handed stance. So instead of teaching them a different stance on field goals and extra points, they simply swap sides of the line. So here's the left side of the line. Uh, the right side of the line usually that's the left side of the line. When we go to the next shot, we're going to see this one from uh, the, after the snap. Eight yards, that's something different from high school. High school distance is usually seven yards. But right off the bat, we see where the big fail is starting. If you look at the right guard, especially, Andrus Pete. Now, I can tell you this for a fact. Here's his left foot that's gone back, his cleats on in the ground. If this would have happened at St. James at Curtis, the young man would have heard about it on Monday and not on Sunday. You never, never, ever step back. That's why you're in the left-handed stance to begin with. And you can cross legs with the center. And those guys are so wide, they really don't have to step very much. So under no circumstance should you be stepping back into the inside with your cleats out of the ground. We're seeing this, a similar error over here. So now they are making contact while they're on one foot. That is not, you don't get much traction on one foot. So when we go to the next one, here the kicker has taken his first step, and here's a problem that he's going to continue to have, that he's a three-step kicker. Uh, 
I learned this from Eddie Murray when I had Coach Fobbs' job in 1982. Coaching, I was coaching punters and place kickers then. Every accurate kicker in the NFL in the history of the league is a two-step kicker. The Dallas kicker is the most accurate kicker in the history of the league. Now, it looks like he takes three steps, but he simply takes a timing step with his left foot, picks it up, puts it down, takes his two steps. The fewer steps, the better. And you're going to see later on how this can lead to errors because the more steps, the more margin for error. And accuracy is what it's all about. We see some mega problems here. Now, this particular field goal rush is standard in the NFL. This is not anything out of the ordinary. Every team in the league does it. You're trying to double team one of the offensive linemen, knock him backwards, because the ball has got to come over here, okay, to be accurate, to go through the uprights, even though the uprights in the pros are the width of the hash marks. So anyway, he's on one foot. He's trying to get low. He realizes, Houston, we got a problem. And right here you see another big error here by Armstead that he has not really positioned this foot hard to the inside as well. Streif is exactly right. Unger is in good shape. So we got a problem. You can see the seam starting to open up. On the next shot, we're starting to see now he's taking his second step, getting ready to go into his third, and we're starting to see some penetration. You see the slide. See how far that foot has slid back. He's a full yard because he hasn't been able to get traction. He's been up in the air and on his toe with it. So, but the perfect hold, and something that's incredible about NFL snappers is that holders don't have to turn the football. If they snap it right, the strings are right where they're supposed to be, boom, it goes right down Armstead. I mean, uh, he, uh, Morstead is exceptional at this. All right, on the next slide, we're looking from the back, and now we're starting to see the penetration here. Armstead knows we got a problem. We got a problem. Evans is trying to come over. We got a major problem here as the kicker is going into his third step. But he's still only two yards into the backfield. Not tragic yet. On the next slide from the sideline, we start to see where part of the problem is. Yes, he's gotten two yards of penetration. But if you look really close, and I'm going to give you a close up of this. You start to see behind the football where the turf has been hit by the kicker's foot. He actually hit it fat. You know, he scraped the ground with his foot. Now, on an artificial turf, what does that do? It's going to bounce the foot into the football. The foot is going to hit higher on the football than is the optimum level, and it's not going to go as high. Lower the foot, the lower you hit it on the football, the higher it goes. Higher on the football, the lower it goes. And when we go to the next shot, we're going to see the ball coming off of his foot. You can see how the, tur how the turf back here has been disturbed. And here we've still got penetration, but it's still only two yards. Not what you want, but he's still six yards from where the ball is coming off the ground. And then we go to the next shot, and now you can see what I was trying to show in contact, how his foot has hit back here, disturbed the turf, and bounced into the football, causing a low kick. So, as in football, I think that's it, you. No, that is, that is where it's being blocked. Now, was there penetration? Yes. Was there penetration because of terrible technique? Yes. Now, you can't tell me that the players were taught correctly. They weren't rehearsed enough. It should be automatic. But still, you should be able to kick the ball over a six yard space, or let's say in this case over a five yard area, should be higher than 10 feet. This isn't gonna be higher than 10 feet at that point. It should be, the ball should be higher than 10 feet as it travels five yards. When I coach place kickers to show them what the optimal height of a place kick should be for distance, you try to kick it at a 45 degree angle, 45 degree launch point. Goal post is 10 feet high. If you move them 10 feet, away from the goalpost, they should be able to kick it over the upright from 10 feet, three and a third yards. Pythagorean theorem. Okay, I know it scares the hell out of most of us, but that's where that comes from. So the ball should have been high enough. There should have been the penetration, and the ball should have been high enough, still been high enough to get over. And I think we have one more. Yeah, and that's where we see, uh, that's where we see the, uh, the block of the kick. So you can tell that this doesn't look right at all. 
This is not where Zach Streif gets hurt. I believe he gets hurt when they make one, but you can see how he's gotten extended. He's getting ready to go over. The next field goal that the kicker makes later in the first half, he gets, he gets pancaked, body slammed, lands on the ground, and ends up bruising, uh, bruising his chest. Uh, this shows you also what Max Unger, how good an athlete Max Unger is, that he can move from center to being a wing on a punt team, because he's got to take two people. He's got to take the inside and ricochet to the outside. So overall, big fail. And when you're mediocre like the Saints are, make no mistake about it, the Saints are not a great football team. They're not a championship caliber football team. But guess what? Most of the league isn't either. The league's got a bunch of mediocre football teams. And that's what the Saints are, and it's personnel. Because what have they cleaned up from the beginning of preseason or even from last year? They don't leave the ball on the ground very much. Two fumbles, they've lost one. They're a plus two in the turnover ratio. No interceptions. They haven't intercepted it either, but they're still a plus two in the turnover ratio. They've reduced the number of penalties. Bad teams leave the ball on the ground, they, get, they have penalties. Missed assignments have been cut down dramatically. They're tackling much better. They're still not good on defense. They gave up 350 plus yards to Eli Manning the other day. Probably one of the quietest 350 you've ever seen. But they tackle. So that is a huge improvement. But they're not very good depth-wise. When some one guy goes out, then they're in, they're in big trouble. And as much as the league is considered a quarterback league, and Drew Brees is playing at such a high level, he is a joy to watch every single day that I get to watch video of him. He's playing at a high level. How many chances will we have in our lifetime to see the best player in a franchise's history playing at such a high level? So enjoy the level that he's playing at. But with... Uh, even though it's a quarterback-driven league, it's really becoming a, quarter, a cornerback-driven league. If you don't have corners, you can't play. If you don't have corners, you can't win. And right now, the Saints have all street uh, undrafted free agents because the couple that they did draft have gotten hurt. So they're not, even though they're playing hard and they're playing fast and they're doing the best they can, right now they're not good enough. They cannot afford big fails in the kicking game like we saw here against the Giants. Made all the difference in the world. Any questions about the Saints? Now I know I have a tendency when somebody asks me what time it is, I tell them how to build a watch. So uh, I appreciate you sticking with me. I hope you learned something that you, you didn't know before. And one last thing from the world history teacher in me. You cannot have a civilization without great cooperation between the citizens and law enforcement that is brought together by the religious leaders and the political leaders. You can't have a civilized society without it. We need to be spending our time not making noise because a protest without a solution is nearly noise. We don't need noise, we need actions. Let's see if we can find a political leader somewhere or a protester to stand up and let's get everybody together to make this country what it's supposed to be. Y'all have a good day. Thank you, Rick. I want to also acknowledge before we close my friend Barrett Bircher,